Hey there, here we go into our final lesson video, before we get to the exercises that is, of one last family of graphs in polar form. These are some of my favorite. They're called limicons. Some people say limisson. Uh, and they're basically, well, they're made up of three types. You've got one that is a looping limicon, or limisson. Uh, a cardioid, which is a type of limicon, kind of looks like a heart. I like to call it a butt curve. Uh, and then you've got a dimpled limisson, or limicon. Uh, and I think limicon or limisson either means snail or slug or something like that in French. I am not a French speaker, so I apologize if I'm wrong, but they kind of have that snail slash slug-like appearance. Kind of in the shell, I guess. But anyway, we're going to go over how to graph them. The important parts are right here. They're summarized. And it's important you know these things, that they're of the form a plus or minus b cosine theta, where a and b are constants, and or a plus or minus b sine theta. Remember that if you have only cosine in a function, as we do, we'll be symmetric about the x-axis. Symmetry will matter. And only sine, symmetric about the y-axis. The same thing applies here. So these are types of curves you need to know for the BC exam just by recognition and how to plot them generally. But you're not going to be asked to plot a graph on the exam, though, so don't worry. Uh, so looking at this thing right here, when a is less than b, we end up with an inner loop. We'll talk about why that is in a little while. You've got cardioids, that's when A is equal to B. We'll talk about why that happens. And then you've got a dimpled limicon. That's where we don't have quite a sharp inset right here, right? It's kind of like a no-budded limicon, if you will. Uh, or a hatchback, if you're into cars, instead of a trunked car. That's where A is greater than B. We'll talk about why those relationships cause the graphs to look like that as we graph them. Okay, so first things first, we have a function of the form A minus B sine theta. Notice here that a is less than b, so we're going to have an inner loop. Okay, we'll talk about what causes the inner loop in a little bit. Now this graph and all of these graphs, the limicons, go from 0 to 2 pi. That's important. I didn't state that in the last bit. We got to go 0 to 2 pi to graph them all out. Here we go rocking and rolling. These are actually the easiest to pick values for. I think pedal curves are the toughest to pick values for. We're just going to go around the unit circle, pick some values, and I am drawing the same thing a second time in a row. So we're going to, again, pick some values around the unit circle, some nice values to see what our picture looks like. So we got 0, pi over 2. Remember, keep that picture in picture in your head. Use your symmetry. Find your max values, your min values, maybe zeros if they're there. And uh, we'll see what that gives us. OK, so looking at this, let's pick theta equals 0. 2 times sine of 0 is 0. 1 minus that is 1. So we got the point. Angle of 0 out to 1. Boom. The next value I'm going to choose, a nice sine value, would be like pi over 6. That's because sine of pi over 6 is 1 half. Times 2, oh, that's going to be 1. 1 minus 1 is 0. So at pi over 6, we're back here to 0. Interesting. We've kind of looped back in like so. Huh. Let's see what happens as we go to, maybe not pi over 3. But I think another good value out of this would be like pi over 2, because that's when sine is at its most. Sine of pi over 2 is 1. 2 times that is 2. 1 minus 2 is negative 1. Interesting. So we're at pi over 2, negative 1. That's down here. Interesting. So what's actually happening here is, if you look at all the sine values between pi over 6 and pi over 2, on the unit circle, that's between here and, well, not there, here and here. And all of those sine values are going to be more than 1 half. If you double a number more than 1 half, you get a number more than 1. And 1 minus a number more than 1 is negative, which is going to cause you to take all these values and reflect them down here like this, causing us to have this loop going down like that. Hopefully, I can make it a little bit smoother, like so. Ah, Now, we know because of the symmetry, this is going to loop back up. Where will we come out of this loop? when we're equal to r equal to 0, huh? which will happen at 5 pi over 6. Why there? Because sine of 5 pi over 6 is 1 half. 2 times 1 half is 1. 1 minus 1 is 0. So we come back around. So all of these values here to here are of values that are more than 1 half. 2 times values more than 1 half are values more than 1. 1 minus that would give us all negative values. So these are all reflecting down here until we get to 5 pi over 6 that ends up back at 0. So now we're back on track, if you will. We'll go to pi. 
2 times sine of pi is 0. 1 minus 0 is 1. Ah, so now we're back to positive values. There we go. So you see how that loop, we come out of it here. And we'll talk more about the inner loop at the end of this. Uh, we'll plug in some other nice values. I'll plug in 7 pi over 6. Sine of that is negative 1 half times a negative 2 is positive 1 plus 1 is 2. So we now have positive values, and it's going out quite a bit. So that goes out there to 2. Ooh, I need a wider berth here. So we're going to angle that thing out there like that. And then let's go down to 3 pi over 2, because that's when sine is going to be most negative. Sine of 3 pi over 2 is negative 1 times negative 2 is 2 plus 1 is 3. Ooh. So it goes all the way down and around like so. And it completes the loop around here using symmetry at 2 pi. So we'll see that sine of 2 pi is 0, 1. Very cool. And there you have a looping limousin that is symmetric about the y-axis. So we can use symmetry. Now, what causes the inner loop? That's when r is equal to 0. And r will be equal to 0 if we set this equal to 0 like this. So some people solve this problem by finding the entry point and the exit point of the loop. So if we solve this out, we'll get 2 sine theta equal to 1, adding this to the right side. Sine theta is equal to 1 half. And sine theta is equal to 1 half here at pi over 6, and here at 5 pi over 6. So why is that the entrance and exit points? Why do we enter the loop first at pi over 6 and exit at 5 pi over 6? Because as we talked about before, every value in between here and here give us negative r values. So we're getting smaller and smaller with r as we approach pi over 6, and then negative, which causes us to reflect in the opposite direction of the intended angles. As we come back around here to pi over 2, that's when this is most. And so 1 minus the biggest will be the most inward in the loop. And then we get less and less negative until we finally come back to 0 and exit the loop. And then we're positive the whole time here because 1 minus negative sign values will give us positive r values going the direction of all the intended angles until we complete our loop. That's it. So your inner loop happens when r equals 0. It happens because r becomes negative. You get this inversion, this belly button, if you will, um, causing this inner loop. It's pretty cool. OK, all right. So we'll do another one. We're going to do this one, which is a cardioid. Why do I know that it is? Because a and b are equal. Another thing to note is that we will be symmetric about the x-axis because this is in terms of cosine. So a equals b means we have a cardioid. And we'll talk about what causes no loop, so cardioid. But the fact that we do indeed end up with like a little bit of a but, if you will. I don't mean like but with one t, but with two. So if we get theta, r, and again, we got our unit circle that we're plotting values along here. Nice job so far, by the way. We're really coming along sweetly here. So as we plug in here, I'll plug in, let's say, theta equals, it's a little crooked, 0. That's going to be when cosine's maximized. Cosine of 0 is 1. 2 is 2 plus 2 is 4. So that's here. And we're just going to plug in, again, some nice values along the way. I'll complete that unit circle. And this is going to be plotted from 0 to 2 pi. So 0, 4 would be right here. Ah, so we start out maximized. Then I'm going to plug in, uh, I don't know, pi over 3. It's a nice value because cosine of pi over 3 is 1 half. Of 2 is 1 plus 2 is 3. So we're at pi over 3, 3. That's over to here. And then pi over 2 is where cosine zeroes out. So it'd be 0 plus 2, which is 2. So we're not quite minimized yet, but see how the r value is kind of coming in on itself a bit. Well, as we go to, I don't know, let's go to 2 pi over 3. That's going to be a negative value. So we get a negative 1 half out of this times 2 is negative 1 plus 2 is 1. Ah, so we're getting further closer to the pole here as we wrap around. And so finally, cosine will be most negative at pi. Cosine of pi is negative 1 times 2 is negative 2 plus 2 is 0. But here's the thing. As we wrap around to pi, a couple of things, actually. And I missed that point pretty badly. All right, there we go. So we've got that first half. Now, we know it's going to bounce back around and come out there because of the symmetry about the x-axis. That's point number one. The reason why, and this is point number two, we're not going to have an inner loop here is r can never be less than 0. Because the most negative that cosine will ever be, this whole it, like value will ever be, is when cosine is at pi, which is equal to 0. That's because a equals b. So a can never be less than b. Therefore, we can never have an r value that is negative 
So we'll never go in the opposite direction of an angle, causing the inversion, that belly button, that loop, inner loop that we saw in the last bit. So we're going to plug in a couple more points just to complete this. Uh, I'll do 4 pi over 3. I'm choosing those points because we get nice half values. Cosine of 4 pi over 3 is negative 1 half, times 2 is negative 1, plus 2 is 1. So we're kind of bouncing back out here at 4 pi over 3. Bloop. There's that symmetry about the x-axis. And if you're wondering, yes, it does make that sound of bloop. Cosine of 5 pi over 3 is 1 half, positive 1 half, times 2 is 1, plus 2 is 3. Ah, now we're really stretching this thing way far out. We're bounced way back out again. And then we're going to complete the loop as we go to 2 pi. Cosine of 2 pi is 1 times 2 is 2 plus 2 is 4. So that's the point 2 pi comma 4. There you have it. A cardioid, uh, which is facing to the right side with the, the butt here because that's where R ends up equaling 0. Pretty sweet. Now we could have done that with symmetry too and stopped at pi. So a couple of tips just as we round this out and then a reminder of what our goals are with all of this. Number one, you want to get a picture in your head first based on what you now know. So you're going to look at a graph and say, oh, it's cosine, and only in terms of cosine, we're symmetric about the x-axis. Cool, that'll help us down the road. What should the curve generally look like? If you're going to study it and say, well, A equals B, it's going to be a cardioid. Maybe you even go further and say, ooh, I know it's going to face, its maximum value will face to the right, and the butt, if you will, that inner part here, makes it a heart, will be on the left side because that's where R will equal zero. You could go that far if you wanted to. Is there an inner loop? Well, if A is less than B, yes. In this case, it's equal to it, so no. Uh, and, and that really, honestly, is going to help you kind of predetermine what this thing will look like. And just practice. The more you practice, the fewer points you'll have to plot, the better you'll get at putting these things on paper. Uh, and then I put down here, plot using the mental image and convenient points. Again, convenient points are points that don't give you like root 3 over 2 or root 2 over 2. Go for the 1 half, the 0, and the 1. All right. So a reminder, our goals in all of this before we go into the exercises, you need to know your polar functions well enough that you've got a clear idea of what the curve will look like before you graph it. So you should look at it and say, oh, that's going to be a pedal curve. It's going to go from 0 to pi, and the maximum pedal curve value will happen at pi over 3, or, or whenever, or it'll have five pedals. You need to know it's going to be a circle centered about the origin or symmetric about the x-axis with a certain diameter, or know that it's a cardioid. You just need to know those basic ideas the best way to do that, practice by graphing them. And so I put here, study the curves and their corresponding functions um, and the conditions that make them unique. What makes an inner loop? Right? What makes you have five pedals versus six pedals? That, again, will come in great handy, I guess. They'll come in well, good use as we get into area, which we'll go into in a couple lessons. And it's one of my favorite lessons. I'm going to stop talking about it. I'm just excited about it. I'll see you in the exercises for this lesson. See you there. Peace.